I'm Scott Rasm, a body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. Help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. Did 20 years in the U.S. military, wrote the number one best-selling book on behavior profiling and influence, and now I train people in those things. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, and I spend most of my time on Wall Street and corporate America. All right. Today, we're going to talk about Lee Harvey Oswald. we got some short clips to look at. We're going to be looking at um, stress and whether or not we think he's being deceptive. The regular breakdown. Greg, tell us about where the videos came from. Yeah, this video is two days after JFK was shot, and he is being transported from the city jail to the county jail, and he is questioned by local reporters. That's all you need. All right, ready? Yeah. Here we go. I know nothing more than that. I do request uh, the someone to come forward hey! to give me uh, a legal assistance. All right, Greg, what do you got? So someone's going to jump on this immediately and say his Miranda rights are being violated because he has not had legal assistance. However, this is 1963. Miranda versus Arizona was 1966, so they had not yet been discovered. So let's take that off the table. It's interesting he does some lip compression at legal assistance. He is here to give one message. That one message is legal assistance. He stutters before he says murder. The, mur uh, the um, uh, murder of a policeman. He also has some kind of snarky little pulling his lips back. If you go and find a baseline of him, and there's only one, he is interviewed by a local police, uh, by a local uh, news station before this happens, long before this happens. He's a little bit on the snarky side, and you can see a little bit of it leaking out here. He's trying to get this information out. I want legal assistance. He's signaling for somebody to come to him. There's some smugness. He look, he's looking down, and you might think that's some accessing cue, but it's because the people are at a different angle, and you're seeing him look down at the mic. I think he thinks he's smarter than he is, and he thinks he's going to do something that's going to get him out of this. That's all I see. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I hit on the same thing about this kind of lip compression that seems to happen there and this pullback there happens about five times in this particular clip and it kind of alerted me because i'm thinking well you know that's interesting that, that happened what's that about is it is he withholding something is it uh one of chase's ideas there around that um what, what is it called in new york chase when people walked around after 9 11 kind of nodding to each other give me the the word for that they, the researchers call that the shared grief expression. Right. So it reminds me of that shared grief expression. So I kind of went down that alley. Is it shared grief for some reason? Is he withholding information? And uh, both of which would be possible. And then Greg sent over this baseline video and I went, oh, no, he does it all the time. That's just. And when he's actually quite assured and actually quite confident, he talk, he does that same expression when he's talking about the difference between uh, Marx and uh, and socialism and communism. So he's quite assured. So look, you know, for this first one, the main thing that jumps out at me is he's actually quite calm and assured in what is actually quite a, a, a media circus, a media jamboree at about 10 past 12 at night. So odd behavior for this kind of situation, I think. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I think you're right. We're seeing behavior that is that is common for someone who's calm. We don't see any stress. His blink rate is fairly normal. It's, it, it's kind of low, actually, for what's going on. He's his he's not trying to, to hurry and get anything out. He does get the part out where he doesn't. Where, where, and the whole thing seems to be centered around not having an attorney. You know, a lot of times it's one of the main things he always gets out. So you're right about that, Greg. Um, his voice and pitch are normal. Everything seems to be calm except for all the people around him. Nobody else in there sounds like they're calm. They're all being loud. They're talking. Things are moving around. Things back then were a lot different than they are today when you're in trouble for something or you're being questioned about something. Because, man, they let in everybody. Everybody could come in, and, and it, which is what happened when he got shot. They had too many people there. But it, it seems like... Uh, Everything, he seems really calm. Now, that may be because the, the cops have him both by, each, you know, one one arm or one on the other just holding him there. I think maybe, are his feet chained or can you tell? Because he seems I to be walking a little funky. I don't think his feet were chained when I saw him moving before. Okay, because I, I couldn't figure that out. Um, I think the lip compression is when he starts thinking he, he's, he's got things he wants to say. He's got blocks of information. So when he stops and he's 
and he's doing those things, that's what he's doing because you see him look around a little bit. We can see him better from the front when he starts that. But I think uh, I think you're right, Greg. I think some of these things are he's ready. He's got information he's going to give, and he's just sort of corralling that stuff. And every time he gets a chance, he he sh- shoots out pretty much the same information every time. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, you guys got a lot of the behaviors here. We're seeing the beginnings of uh, a victimhood narrative here. And I'm going to dig way into that here in just a few minutes. But as far as the nonverbal behavior that we're seeing here, one thing that isn't in his baseline video at all is this immediate mouth closure that you see right after his statements. He'll say, well, this is all I know. And then the lips shut immediately. And if somebody does that all the time, it's meaningless. But if someone starts suddenly doing that in the conversation, when you start asking them a question, that's a big deal. Should be a red flag. That's all I got. I really don't know what the, what the situation is about. Nobody has told me anything. It's something I'm accused of, uh, of uh, murdering a police chief. I know nothing more than that. I do request uh, someone to come forward to give me uh, a legal assistance. Well, I was uh, questioned by a judge. However, I uh, protested at that time that I was not allowed legal representation. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, just one thing on this for me, which is how he leans into that mic on legal representation. Again, to to the point that everybody's made here, it just reinforces the idea of that's what his message seems to be at this point. That's his protest at this point, the protest around legal representation. But again, super confident, not necessarily what you'd expect from somebody um, in, in a, who might feel they're in a lot of trouble, more that they want to protest around how they're being treated in this situation. So again, really interesting as a second video there. Chase, what do you got on this one? I'd say he seems pretty calm. And I'd say a lot of this behavior that I'm seeing here based on my thousands of hours of experience suggests that he might've been craving this level of attention. The blink rate is slow. He's ensuring and gets close to the microphone only when there's some volume in the background, but only when that exact precise thing I I'm, I'm being screwed over that message gets pushed into the mic. Pretty interesting. Scott, what do you think? All right. I agree with you. Um, He's calm at the very beginning of this. You can see him taking a big deep breath through his nose and let it out. I think that's just, just an adapter, but you can actually hear him doing it. Um, that with a large, the large exhalation. That's what I have here as an adapter. Um, and I think you're. Right. I think when he's leaning toward the mic, it's starting to get loud in there, and he wants to get that point across because apparently that's the main thing, man. The needs a lawyer bad. Um, and then yeah, so I think we're just seeing a hint, a hint of frustration building because he's having to say the same thing over and over and over again, and he's maybe getting maybe he's worn out. You know how who knows how long he's been up and what's been happening to him. And I'm sure they've been talking to him, trying to get him to talk and all that. So I'm sure he's he's about worn out. So I think we're seeing a combination of things there. We're seeing be he's relaxed, but maybe he's relaxed because he's worn out and he's wanting to get his point across back because he needs some help in there. And uh, of course, like you were saying, Greg earlier, the Miranda rights haven't been put in place yet. So he's just kind of hanging on for dear life, I guess, at that point. So Greg, what do you got? Yeah, a couple of data points. I think that number one, something you just said, he'd been interrogated twice by this time. We know that. We also know that based on what I've read, at least, that the Dallas Bar Association leader came and offered assistance and he didn't want it. He said, I only want an ACLU lawyer or Communist Party lawyer, he called out by name. Uh So this guy has an agenda and he makes me think of Forrest Gump here when Forrest Gump's telling the, his girlfriend, I think you belong in Greenbow, Alabama, like that. <laughs> it sounds like that to me. It's overstated. It's <laughs> He's leaning into the mic. He's trying to drive his point home. And I just see it as, OK, I've got this thing. I made myself famous. Now I got to get my protection. That's what I, I feel like he's doing here. That's all I see. I'll leave it at that. I thought you were going to say she tastes like cigarettes. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. But yeah, you see it. You see what he's doing. He's trying to get that yeah. message out to get that person. And you can see it. You can see he's fishing for something. You can't tell what, but we can see it in his body language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Well, I was uh, questioned by a judge. However, I uh, protested at that time that I was not allowed to legal 
Did you kill the president? No, I have not been. Nobody said what? Sir? You have been. Nobody said what? Okay, we can't hear you. Okay. What did you do in Russia? All right, Chase, what do you got? <laughs> we got to cut that. That's right. That's wow, right. Dude, I had to home. look away. We're done. I had to look away. Oh, that's all we needed. Good. That's the that shot we needed. Good. All right. Wow. Well, no, Can we do that again? That out. No. Let's go ahead. Chase, what do you got? This is an obvious deflection response. And there's a hint of regret here, I think, after he talks about the paper reporters in the hallway. He pulls away from the microphone, adjusts his posture. There's some lip compression there. And as a profiler, you can start to see his struggle with self-control. And personally, uh, as a profiler, this is one of the very first things I assess in any human being that I meet on Zoom, on a phone call. You can see this on the on the freeway. When you're driving, you can assess the levels of self-control of other drivers. So his wife attempted suicide by hanging herself with a clothesline and and he caught her and just started beating her with that piece of cord because she was going to abandon him, which leads to some severe narcissistic tendencies, which I think we're seeing here. The, I think in this day, the DSM-1 had just been invented or was just about to be invented. So they would have called it probably something else that I don't know. But we're starting to see a little trickle of that behavioral information here. Since we're not just doing uh, body language, we are the behavior panel. I want to make uh, a big part of what's coming up here about his behavior. Uh, so that's all I got for that one. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, there's a little bit of what I would call self-amusement in his face. You see a little light in the middle of his face as his cheekbones rise a little. He doesn't smile, but he almost smiles. His eyes light. I think he is self-impressed with the fact that he didn't answer the question he redirected. Nobody has advised me of that. That's a very specific way of distancing from the question. His blink rate goes up, and I can't tell if the voice break is from stress, from something that's happened to now, but there's a little quiver in his voice, which means something. And then I see a little sarcasm or contempt as his face changes shapes on the left side, and it, it's almost like he's got a little smile there. I, and that blink rate was up only for a short period of time. I, I think this guy is just avoiding everything that he can and trying to get his message out. That's what I see. Scott, what do you got? All right, man. Yeah. Okay. You nailed a couple of things there that I was going to get into because I didn't think anybody would see it. Okay. Well, coming out, coming out of the gate, there's quite a few things to pay attention to here. Um, when he was asked, did you kill the president? We see him move back a little bit. Now, normally you'd see that and say, oh, he's trying to distance himself from what's going on. But if you watch his left arm, you can see it come down, then his shoulder go back. So that guy's brain is pulling him back a little bit. I'm sure it's because when he said that, the, the, the police officer's like, oh, here we go. So that's what that's what that's about. And you see that on, in entrepreneurs when you ask them. You can even see it on Shark Tank when they ask them something they really don't know or that someone else has given them the information. You'll see them as they give it. They'll see them sometimes a full half step back. But a lot of times you'll see them move back very slowly. They don't do it every time. And it doesn't mean they're lying every time they do it. But that's just something to look for when you're looking for someone uh, being deceptive. When he says you've been charged, we have been charged with that. That's where it gets interesting for me because – I watched it, and I saw a couple of things you did, Greg, so I slowed it down, and I went frame by frame. And there's a micro expression in there uh, where he's smiling. He's standing up straight, that chin goes up, and he's smiling and doing this. Then it morphs into, it, we're seeing a blending of expressions. He goes from that blank expression into this little smile, and, I'll, and then he gets that contempt in there before he turns around and goes off. I think that's really important, because when I, I saw that, I went, holy smokes, I, I've never heard, I've never thought about this way before, but he looks proud. It's like he, they just tagged him. It's like, dude, you have been charged with that. He's like, all right, here we go. That's, you know, that's what I wanted. That's, that's me. So that was really interesting. I thought from, from that point of view, he looks like he's happy that happened and he's proud of it. All right, Mark, I what you got? something. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I, I agree with everybody there. So I wrote down earlier today, my spelling, you, nobody will be able to read. But anyway, it says it says righteousness there. Mm -hmm. Essentially, righteousness. There is some self-righteousness. And we see the same expression with him in the baseline when he's talking about the difference between Marxism and, and communism or socialism. I can't. He says something like, you know, I'm a Marxist. That doesn't mean like I'm a communist, I think is what he says. And there's this 
self-righteous or righteousness that comes across his face. We see it in this. Now, it's interesting. We get a clear no from him on that uh, on uh, after that question. Um, but there's no surprise in his face at all that he's being asked this question. Like, I'd be really surprised. If I didn't know about this, I'd be surprised. There would be some moment where there would be shock or surprise in most other people. Not surprised this by this. I've not been charged with that. Uh, in fact, no one has said that to me yet. Ah, yet. So there is an expectation that they will. So where does that expectation come from? Does it come from just this environment? He's walked into this environment and gone, well, yeah, somebody's going to charge me with something very, very soon, like killing a president. Or did he know this a long time back, that he's most likely to get charged with this? Certainly there's some foreknowledge that this could happen. Newspaper reporters in the hall. Now, so I, I hear stress in hall. I don't know what the stress is about, but there's something happening out there or there was something about that moment in the hall that causes real stress for him that he's unsure about. So I'd be interested in that. I'd like to ask him, you know, so what, what's up with the hall? What are you surprised about? What are you interested in? What's causing you the stress? We're not able to do that uh, now anymore, but that's where I would go if I had the opportunity. There, that's what you have been. Nobody said what? Sir? You have been. Nobody said what? Okay, man. Okay. What did you do in Russia? Excellent. Sir? I work in that building. Were you in the building? Naturally, if I work in that building, yes, sir. Back up, man. No, they're taking me in because of the fact that I live in the Soviet Union. I'm just a patsy. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this guy's telling a story. He's iterative storytelling. He came there with a plan for what he wanted to deliver. If you don't believe that, go back and compare his cadence in the baseline video that we talked about. Compare it in every conversation he's had and listen to him slow down. When a person's trying to ensure that you listen to what they are saying and his smugness comes out, I think this guy was probably hard to like in life, would be my guess. If you knew him, you probably wouldn't like him a whole lot. And he goes to that slowed cadence. Well, naturally, if I work in that building, I was. And he's got that droning kind of thing where he's trying to go after him. And then he says, did you shoot? And he said, I work in that building. He, all that cadence shift tells me he's trying to get some details out that protect his story. And I think if he had lived, it would have been interesting to see a cross-examination of him on the stand and all that kind of thing. But he doesn't, so we don't know. That's what I got. Uh, Scott, what do you got? I agree with you. And it, it's, he's say again, you're right. I don't know how I can add to this. He's saying the same thing over again. No, I didn't. But he's adding that part about, I worked in the building. This is all kind of, it's a lot of chaff. He's not really redirecting as much as right. he is chaffing, just throwing a bunch of stuff out there about why he's innocent. Of course, again, he hasn't been able to talk to a lawyer. So he's, uh, he's worried about that. So it sort of makes sense. But at the same time, that's odd to be saying all those things. He never says no when they say, did you shoot the president? Then with Mark, he never says no. No, I didn't shoot. I didn't shoot anybody. He's always says I didn't shoot anybody. But he starts off with I didn't shoot anybody. So, did you shoot the president? I, I didn't know. I didn't shoot anybody. He doesn't come out with an emphatic no anywhere. And that's all I'd be talking about. If I got a hint that they thought I'd shot a president... Any of you guys, too, you don't think the first thing out of your mouth would be, no, it wasn't me, I didn't do it. I swear to God, here, so-and-so knows this. I'm, you wouldn't be able to shut up. Granted, maybe he's tired. Maybe he's been doing that in the back room the whole time. But I think when he got out in front of the cameras, that's he would be selling that, no, I didn't do it thing. It wasn't me, I didn't do it. All that. We don't hear any of that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. It's, it's avoidance. Um, did you shoot the president? There's, it's just like you say, there's no no. It's obvious. You'd say, no, no, it wasn't me. Don't know who it was. You know, here's what I know. Here's what I don't know about it. No, he goes, I work in that building, put stress on building. Naturally, if I work in that, so what were you doing there? Well, naturally, were, were you there at the time? Naturally, if I work in that building. So he goes, building, building, two stresses there. Um, it's because I, I mentioned the Soviet Union. He puts a stress on Soviet Union. And then I'm just a patsy, puts the stress on that. So he's building his case for why he's been singled out building building soviet union therefore i'm a patsy it's a beautiful piece of logic but of course anybody you know listening to it goes well no 
just no. There'll be some more reasons why you've been singled out on this one, not just because building, building Soviet Union. Uh, there would be a bunch of other people you could have found in that building because they work in the building and they've mentioned the Soviet Union. You got hauled out. You got picked uh, in particular, maybe for other reasons. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with all of you guys. And this is a perfect example of an ambiguity statement. And this would be an example. This would be like, I asked Scott, uh, what'd you do when you left the office at five? And Scott's answer was, I usually go straight home every day. <laughs> That's kind of a non-answer and it's, it's ambiguous. There's a lack of denial here, but we see a continuation of this pattern of this perception of victimhood. So, Really quick, I'm going to go a tiny bit longer than I normally do. So Russia denies this guy's tourist visa while he's trying to become a spy with the KGB, laughs him off. So then he uh, sets up this tour guide lady who is kind of attached to him to meet him at the hotel. Then he cuts himself in a tub right when she's supposed to show up, not in a way that would kill himself. So she can find him along with this hilariously dramatic entry in what he called his historic diary and it doesn't work for him. So he's playing the victim. Uh, it works well in, in some cases. It worked well in this case because the KGB actually shipped him off to uh, Minsk uh, to avoid an international incident with this guy. So while he's later on, he's at the Soviet consulate in Mexico city. When he comes back and he tells three KGB officers, the FBI is out to kill him. They're plotting his murder right at that very moment. He starts crying to the FBI. I'm afraid they're going to kill me. You need to let me into Cuba. Later, he's arrested in Texas and says all his civil rights are being violated. Then he claims to be a victim of police brutality. And that takes us back to his patsy statement to the press. In other words, Oswald saying that the entire world's unfair to him. But does he tell his wife, his brother, his family, or the authorities that he's a patsy or that he was set up? No, because he didn't have an audience. And of course, in his interrogation, when nobody's looking, he lies and is a just as blatantly arrogant a-hole to the authorities. Doesn't ever talk about being a victim. Uh, but that's not the same dude that we're seeing when he's in front of a crowd. So this is, again, speaking to a potential for some uh, malignant narcissism or some kind of a, a narcissistic personality disorder. Sir, I work in that building. Were you in the building? Naturally, if I work in that building, yes, sir. Back up, man. Come on, man. No, they're taking me in because of the fact that I live in the Soviet Union. I'm just a patsy. I didn't shoot anybody, sir. I haven't been told what I'm here for. You have a lawyer? No, sir, I don't. Okay, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so one element there that I think is interesting is there's some politeness there. I didn't shoot anyone, sir. Now, I, as I understand it, the guy's from Texas, and, and, and I know, Chase, you're from Texas, uh, and I know that I think saying sir now and again is actually, that's quite culturally um, normative, I, I, I think. Uh, but still, you know, in this situation, in this situation where you're going, hey, did you shoot the president? I wouldn't expect that level of politeness. So that interests me because I know often when people are being deceitful, their level of politeness will escalate somewhat. So that intrigues me. This whole idea, I didn't shoot anyone either. That with, Well, we're not talking about anyone. <laughs> we're talking about the president. So you could, we don't need the generalization there. It would be better if his denial included the idea of the, of, of the president or that person or, or him. Um, the, the, but the biggest thing here is there is aggression here and not surprise. You know, aggression here and not fear. And I would really rather be seeing fear or surprise in this kind of media circus where you are, which shouldn't be normal for him. He's, he's, he's led quite a life, but I don't think he's ever experienced anything like this before. 
I want to see him more more out of water here. And actually, he seems quite happy with this level of aggression, this level of front, answering the questions, the way he's answering them in in this little kind of kind of self-righteous way doesn't doesn't feel good to me. Uh, Chase, what do you think on this? So uh, I agree with you. We have a non-answer statement. Uh, so it doesn't really answer the question directly. And I agree with you, Mark, on the little spike in politeness. I did an interrogation one time, talked to the guy, he called me bro and dude for like 35 minutes. And then I say, did you take money from the company? He's like, oh, sir, absolutely not, sir. No, sir. <laughs> it was it was really dramatic. But I have it on uh, recording. I'll send it to you guys. But uh, yeah. so there's a uh, he showed Oswald also has this life history of being deceptive and lying. He lied about his age to his future wife in Russia. He uh, told uh, his future wife his mom was dead just so he could gain some sympathy so she wouldn't go date this other guy. And Oswald even wrote about. Uh, the events in his life in his just this melodramatic diary that hadn't even occurred yet. He wrote about future events just to, just to help craft the narrative and almost giving the impression that he was kind of crafting an artifact to be enjoyed later. And it worked. People really dig into those things. And his whole life was kind of wrapped in these lies significantly from a behavioral perspective. He told lots of lies that were unnecessary and inconsequential, which from a behavioral perspective would, would point towards some kind of pathology there. And there in this clip, reverting back to conditions instead of his innocence. And think about that for a minute. When you watch this again, conditions instead of innocence. And there's a little more desire for victimhood. This illustrates this wonderful point here. I think that adults will continue to exacerbate behaviors that gain them reward or kept them safe as children. And he had a rough, rough childhood, not excusing anything, but all of us, even if we're healthy, we continue these patterns that kept us safe or helped us avoid some kind of harm as kids. That went a little long. Sorry, Scott. Uh, I'm going to keep mine simple. He didn't say no. He said, I didn't shoot anybody. You don't say that unless you unless you're getting you know, some information is coming and there's more than one person involved. I didn't shoot anybody. You know, I didn't, he didn't say anybody who didn't say I didn't shoot anybody. That just makes me think that he's done a little something more than he should have. If, if you're talking to somebody and you say, did you take the earrings off the whatever it was? They said, I didn't take anything. Really? Okay. So that makes me think, well, there's probably other things to look at somebody missed before they brought this person to the place to talk to. <laughs> How's that sound? So, uh, I don't know. I think he's, I think he's pregaming there at that point. I think that must have been the very first and he, he's, he's getting his, his pregame happening. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I, the, I didn't shoot anybody. I haven't been told what I'm here for. That is a chaff and redirect the classic chaff meaning i'm spraying out something you pick up on it and then the redirect is i answer that question that's what he's trying to do is get them to say how could that be have you talked to an attorney you saw that do you have a lawyer he's trying to feed that path and get what he wants i think chase you said exactly what i always say whatever made the organism successful the organism is still going to do this yeah. guy has been through a lot of bs in his life and he's been successful Maybe it's borderline personality. Maybe it's something else. But he's been successful by making this person happy by giving them whatever it worked. And then Mark, I think when he says, sir, yeah, there's some Southern. When you're talking to the cops in the South, you typically go, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. But I also think that he's doing what it takes for people to think poor guy doesn't have an attorney. So he can get to that attorney he's after because I think this guy is self-important and he's just trying to play the game that's all i see and all of his language all that stuff he's everything he's doing it has an intent to pull this story back together and get that attorney that's all i see in the entire thing all right great i, vote, you shoot I didn't shoot anybody sir i haven't been told what i'm please, here for please, you have a lawyer no sir i don't let's we'll throw around the room and uh, sort of see what we think about this mark why don't you go first we'll go to chase and then greg and then i'll wrap it 
Yeah, if this person has no involvement in this, is is utterly innocent of anything that's going on, he's way too calm, he's not surprised, there's no fear, The aggre- even if we take some of the aggression there, it's not amped up high enough that people get when they are falsely accused of certainly a, a, an extreme crime in, in this. There's none of the behaviours here that I would expect to see from somebody who has zero involvement and is totally mystified around what what's going on here chase what do you think i think we are this is my opinion that we are most likely seeing somebody with some factor three uh psychopathy his whole life was sensation seeking behavior parasitic lifestyle manipulative grandiosity this lack of remorse that he's got fantasies of power like becoming a kgb super spy jason Bourne, uh entitlement he he meant he thought that he was meant to lead the country. He told uh, his girlfriend he was going to be the prime minister of America. And that was, that was part of his shtick. That was part of his beliefs. So I think that's a factor three, uh, potentially a factor three personality. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, guys, anybody that we see who's in a bind, we know that they do this. Their forehead draws. There's concern. We don't see concern in this guy. We see no grief. If you accuse me of killing the president, I know that's going to, not going to end pretty well. Something's going to happen. I'm going to jail. I'm probably going to get thrown in with some guys who are going to not treat me nicely. And this is 1963. The laws were a little different. People were treated a little differently. I think I probably would have some concern, something in my forehead. I would have some feelings of negative emotion. We know that psychopaths don't experience negative emotion the same way, so maybe he's a psychopath. But certainly his body language, everything that we expect a person to show us when they're feeling duress is not here. So it makes me automatically go, well, this is part of something that he has planned to get himself in front of these cameras to deliver some message. And that message is legal representation. That's all we hear in the entire thing. Scott, what do you got? Wow. Okay. it sounds to me like the way things are, are are laying out here, the way he's acting from the beginning to the end, he's a little bit excited there in this last one, which is more toward the beginning. But as he goes through this, he doesn't, see, like everybody said, he doesn't look worried, man. doesn't look like there's the things that are going on that should be. The first thing I said was he, we're not seeing behaviors of someone who's stressed. We're seeing somebody who's very calm, which lets, leads me to believe this guy's got a plan or he's part of a plan at this point. So he's, he thinks he knows what's going to happen because he just has to do these things. And I'm not so sure he thought it would end up where he would be there. But if they, but if, if there was a plan and there was more than one person involved, then they say, here's what you say. If this, if you get caught, here's what you do. I think he had a plan and he was, if he was part of the plan, I think he's relying on that, relating back to it when he's thinking, what am I supposed to say next? What am, what am I supposed to do? Because he's staying on that one line and just, and just talking like that. All right. Well, I think this was a good one, fellas, and we'll see you next time. See you now. Sí, de la